the the room. We're waiting for all panel or attendees to pass through the waiting room and we'll go live on YouTube and we'll start shortly. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this talk on recognition, recognition and healing through art to artists in conversation. My name is Alex and I am the manager of the Monterey Peace and Justice Center. This is the fourth in our August events to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings that occurred August 6th and 9th in 1945. This series is a project of the Monterey County branch of Women's International League for Peace and freedom. I am honored today to welcome our two speakers, Joe Aki Owe and Jerry Takigawa. They will each present a collection of their art and discuss their personal histories relevant to their work. Through their art, they will offer a portal through which we can understand what it meant to grow up as Japanese Americans in the U.S. between the 1950s, 60s, and 70s facing injustices, discrimination, and indignities that persist to this day. Please feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask questions as they arise. Jerry and Aki will address them in the final segment of our program. And this webinar will be made available on our YouTube channel, and you'll find the channel link in the chat. For first time users, it's important to note that there's a drop down menu at the top where you can choose um, the feature you want to view the, the webinar in, either in speaker view or gallery view. I will now introduce our speakers. Jerry Takigawa is an independent photographer, designer, and writer. He received the Imogen Cunningham Award, the Clarence John Laughlin Award, Center's Award, Curator's Choice, and the Rhonda Wilson Award. His work is in the permanent collections of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the Crocker Muse Art Museum, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Library of Congress, and the, Moder the Monterey Museum of Art. Jerry lives and works in Carmel Valley, California. I'm also honored to introduce Joe Aki Owe, who attended UCLA, the Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and UC Berkeley, where he obtained a PhD in architecture and planning. He went on to work as a corporate workplace consultant and researcher and transitioned in 2012 to focus full-time on his passion, art. Most recently, he is painting abstract figures relating to the Asian American experience. He and his wife, Elaine McCaw, moved full-time to Pacific Grove in 2010. Thank you both, Jerry and Joe, for joining us today. First, we'll hear from Jerry Takigawa, and he'll share his work. Thank you, Jerry. Alex. <clears throat> so, are we? Uh, are we good there? Yes, we can see. Thank you. All right. Um, so thanks to Alex and Catherine and, of course, all the sponsors of this event. Uh, given the, uh, the occasion, I thought I'd just show this uh, older invitational poster they had done in 1985 for the 40th anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing. In, in Japan, every year, the J Japan Designers Association, uh, they every year do a whole bunch of posters to commemorate that day. And uh, in 85, they had invited an American association to, to participate. So this was one of the pieces. So Balancing Cultures is the title of a photography series that began for me as a personal identity project. With this work I'm about to show, I'm, I'm expressing what I believe my ancestors felt they could not say out loud because of their shame and the threat of retribution. Uh, the series really began recently when I first saw photographs of my parents 
in the Jerome, Arkansas concentration camp. This is uh, an example of one of the camp photos I saw that compelled me to do this project. Uh, my brother and I found them after my mother passed. And until I saw these images, camp as a word was just the place in stories. And, and seeing it in a photograph made it real. The tar paper barracks signaled camp immediately. This uh, particular image is referring to two loyalty questions that were an affront to the Japanese Americans in light of their incarceration without due process. Looking at the past, I believe, is useful, especially if we can see how it relates to the present. As uh, the pandemic exposes all the flaws in our world, can we agree that nature demonstrates that diversity is a proven advantage for survival? It's the one, one thing, it's one thing really to desire the, to end racism, but I think we need to be ready to put forth solutions that embody equity for all. This image was the first one I created for the project. I knew that I wanted all the images to have text in them. In this case, the text is shredded and is from the well-known instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry poster. Gaman means enduring the seemingly unbearable with patience and dignity. Growing up, my parents encouraged me to be American so that I would be safe, become American and become educated. They protected me from the truth of what actually happened to them. And they did that through their silence. Unintentionally, the silence imprinted a kind of desire for social justice in me. Shame in the resulting silence and stoicism after the war became a shadow legacy for much of my generation, the Sansei. Shame is the feeling of being flawed. And in this case, the flaw was being Japanese. A Jap's a Jap, it makes no difference whether he's, not a, he's an American citizen or not. This was our commanding general of Western Defense Command, General DeWitt, or Lieutenant General DeWitt, this quote uh, encouraged Roosevelt to enact the executive order. Perhaps my parents passing in, and then the discovery of the camp photos gave me permission to finally speak out. If silent sanctions, then documentation is resistance. In my research, I found a world of hatred and hysteria aimed at all people of Japanese ancestry. Jay Takagawa was held for possession of two red signal lights and navigational charts of Monterey Bay. This quote from the Herald, Monterey Herald. Intuitively, I wanted to make the paper boats out of the maps, signaling the contraband was relatively harmless. I also discovered the jealousy of the Japanese success in fishing, agriculture, and business. Uh, this is a photo of my grandfather's fish market on Fisherman's Wharf before, much before the war. Immediately following Pearl Harbor, community, community elders were sent to military prisons my grandfather was sent to a prison in Bismarck, North Dakota. The Japanese kanji in this photo reads, the head of the household has been arrested in Louisiana. Who is going to support the family? His address book was full of messages from fellow prisoners as they were being separated and sent to different camps around the country.
120,000 Japanese were incarcerated in 10 concentration camps throughout the US without due process of law. In Scrabble, there's only one K. So I went with like goes with lie. My grandmother was a chef, so I was really not surprised to see her photograph with the kitchen staff. She's the person just to the right of like. When the prisoners were transported to the camps, each family was identified by a family number. My family went to Arkansas by train with the shades drawn and accompanied by armed guards. My mother said she was afraid they would all be executed. I had to recreate the ID tag for this image, but the family numbers are real. Ironically, two of my uncles served in the military. To prove their loyalty, many Nisei served in the military while their families were imprisoned by the government. This is my uncle visiting his mother, my grandmother in camp. Shikata ganai is another Japanese saying that means it cannot be helped. It's an oft repeated phrase in the camps. My mother and her brother following her in uniform, consistent to the end, the war relocation authority is still referring to the incarceration as relocation. These cards were issued to my parents when they left the camps to new employment in Chicago. By this time, the Japanese were exonerated of any wrongdoing. So the mugshot really was it necessary? It seems as though they're being seen still as criminals. In 1945, a petition of 440 signatures, including notably Edward Weston, John Steinbeck, and others uh, were, that was uh, submitted to the Japanese American Citizens League in Monterey, California to let returning Japanese Americans know they were welcome. Being welcomed home was not a typical response in most West Coast cities after the war. Monterey deemed himself itself an early sanctuary city. Uh, this petition was actually found in the JCL Hall's kitchen drawer in 2013 by Tim Thomas, the local historian. 38 years later in 1980, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Citizens deemed Race, prejudice, war hysteria, and failure of political leadership were the primary causes that led to the evacuation or the executive order. It really uh, it wasn't military necessity as originally stated. Much of my life was spent trying to understand and express the unidentified feelings, those, those nudges that motivated my behavior in life and in art. Here at age five, returning to my parents' birthplace, Monterey, is the beginning of my journey to sort out the post-war psychological trauma that they carried. All Americans are members of minorities. Almost all of these minorities have at one time or another been fractioned off and persecuted. It's a quote by Alfred McLung Lee, an American sociologist in 1946. Creatively, I would say that this is one of the big takeaways for me in doing this project and many of my projects. This may ring true today because the truth is so much harder to come by. Balancing Cultures is the most personal project I've undertaken to date. And as an artist, I'm constantly driven to, by the need to be seen and all alternating with the need to hide. But I make art because it's healing to me. Ultimately, I believe 
healing the world begins with healing ourselves. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. Um, your family history, giving us a sense of what you've gone through and your family has gone through and your photography. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Joe Aki Owe. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Catherine. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today on this program. And um, before I show my art, I wanna show, I wanna go through uh, a bit of my personal history that relates to Hiroshima. Uh, next slide, please. That is me at age four, but when I was age two and a half, I was there with my mother on August 6th, 1945 in Hiroshima. And all I remember from that day is a brilliant flash, a thousand times brighter than a camera flash and maybe lasting 10 times longer. But, you know, that's all I remember. Uh, all the rest that I know about that day in the days following was uh, told by my mother when she was interviewed many years later, 61 years later, by the A-bomb survivors organization in Japan. And I'll tell you more about that later, but this is what she told me about the A-bomb. So we were in our home and as soon as she sensed the blast, she threw herself on me and shoved me under the uh, kitchen table. And uh, when the fl flash subsided, the house began to collapse and it caught on fire. And her instinct was of course to get us out of the house, out of the city. So she shoved me outside the uh, front door and said, Akinori, don't move. And she went back inside to gather some provisions and food and came back out minutes later and I was still there, hadn't moved, but I was covered from head to toe in black muck. That black muck was a mixture of radioactive fallout and rain, as we later found out. So it is today called black rain. My mother uh, and I escaped to Miyajima, which is about three hours south of Hiroshima. And uh, my mother went back the following day to Hiroshima to find her step-grandmother who had been there on a pilgrimage. And uh, she did not find her step-grandmother, but what she did find was thousands and thousands of people, uh, wounded, dead, uh, in the water, in the river, on the banks, in the streets, some crying for water, crying for help. And she told me that she just felt helpless because she was, she had, she was only one person. There are thousands who wanted help and she had nothing with her to help them. Uh, so she uh, came back to Miyajima that evening, but she went back the following day uh, to find her grandmother and uh, was not successful. Next slide, please. This is a picture of my mother with her work colleagues in happier days shortly before the war ended. And uh, about nine days after the A-bomb, my mother and uh, some of her neighbors went to the, uh, a neighbor had a radio, so they went to, the, uh, to her home and they listened to the emperor uh, say, that Japan had lost the war and Japan had surrendered. Everyone was sobbing in that room, crying because they had lost. And who knew what the future held for Japan? 
My mother was also crying, but crying for joy. She was so happy that the war had ended. After all, in the war, she had lost her home. She had lost her close relative in Japan. She had lost her possessions. She even lost her friends. The men in this photograph, all these men were dead by the time of the uh, A-bomb. And of her woman friends, most of them were killed either before the A-bomb and if they were alive before the A-bomb, during the A-bomb, when the A-bomb was dropped, they were dead shortly thereafter. So she had lost everything. And so uh, my mother said, uh, things were very destitute. We stayed in Japan for four more years. And uh, in 1949, those were, I would say, uh, they were very hard, hard years, according to my mother. Um, Japan was destitute. There was very little, little food. And my mother said, thank God for uh, her family in Hawaii who sent her care packages because they, that made a difference. So in 1949, shortly after my father passed away when I was six, we uh, returned to Hawaii and we were able to return because my mother was a sansei, a third generation Japanese American. And her grandfather had immigrated to uh, Hawaii uh, in 1898. Next slide, please. Fast forward to uh, Hiroshima today. This was a photo taken in 2016. And uh, this is the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. It's a beautiful park, right pretty much where the epicenter of the blast was. And the building you see in the background there is the Hiroshima Industrial Promotion Hall. And that is pretty much there as it was right after the bomb. Uh, left there as a reminder of that day and the destructive power of the A-bomb. I want to say a little bit more about the A-bomb Survivors Organization. I said in the beginning that that is when I learned the story and uh, because my mother never talked about it. I think out of the fear of revisiting that nightmare that was Hiroshima. Um, but uh, we went in 2006 to uh, register for this program. The Avon Survivors Organization program is supported by the Japanese government. It provides medical assistance and uh, also conducts research on the long-term effects of radiation. And uh, they have uh, biannual checks from teams of doctors from Japan. By the way, the organization uh, supports survivors, whether you're Japanese, or uh, any other nationality who happened to be in Hiroshima that day. Next, please. In 2016, uh, President Barack Obama became the first US president to visit Hiroshima. In his speech, he said the memory of 1945 must never fade. That memory allows us to fight complacency it fuels our moral imagination. It allows us to change. Despite those wonderful words, the US government has never officially apologized for the atomic bombing of Hiroshima or Nagasaki. In fact, by international law, that act today would be considered a crime against humanity. And uh, I think an interesting quote is from Robert McNamara, the uh, Secretary of Defense. And uh, he said famously, as pertains to Hiroshima, Nagasaki and other cities that were uh, bombed in Germany and in Japan, uh, that if we had lost the war, We'd, we'd have been all charged as war criminals. I should add that 
as far as I know, the A-Bomb Survivors Organization is solely supported by the Japanese government. Uh, the US government does not provide support for this organization. Next, please. So with that, I'm gonna end my, that part of my personal experience and uh, talk about my art. And I call this art, it's a series, it's called uh, Visible Invisible. And I call it that because to me, Asian Americans, Japanese Americans are invisible in this society. And my art seeks to show us as visible, as meaningful, as full human beings. Next slide. I mentioned that my, uh, my mother's grandfather uh, immigrated to Hawaii in 1898. His name was Miyataro Owe, and uh, he was a carpenter. And uh, he was a carpenter to the Maui sugar cane plantation. And in it, you see uh, him with a tie. And this is based on a photograph of um, the wedding of one of his daughters. And uh, most likely, you know, the usual uniform was probably khakis. Um, but he came with nothing and he started a life in this country. And today there are over 200 always. Uh, and uh, so he started something back more than 100 years ago. Next, please. Father, I did not know. I said uh, my father passed away when I was six, so I really didn't know him very well, and uh, or at all, really. And my mother uh, rarely spoke about him. But what she did tell me was that he was an engineer. Uh, he lost everything in the war, um, and he was despondent. He turned to alcohol and became an alcoholic and uh, died at an early age in the mid thirties uh, of tuberculosis. Next please. Toil, toil, sweat and fears. And this is a uh, picture of agricultural workers in the Central Valley in the 1930s. And here you see them spraying the fields with uh, pesticides before pesti pesticides were known to be harmful to the environment or humans. But it is typical of a lot of the work that was done by the first and second generations. It was hard, but also dangerous. Next, please. Woman of the canes. You know, the woman worked in the fields too. But, and uh, my, my grandmother worked in the cane fields and sugar, sugar uh, cane fields and the pineapple fields of Hawaii. And um, that too was difficult work. You're swinging machetes all day long, cutting down the cane, loading them onto trucks and clearing the fields and uh, burning the fields for replanting. Um, so, but, you know, like many women of her generation, they worked many long hours under hard conditions. Next, please. Hard. It's a farmer in the Central Valley in the 1930s. And, uh, you know, it, I, I call it hard because it's hard soil, hard work, hard men. Uh, but these Japanese American farmers, uh, especially in the 20s and 30s, they started the agricultural business as we know it today in Monterey, Salinas, and Watsonville areas. So that today they are the vegetable, vegetable basket of America. They were the ones that prepared the soil, brought in vegetables, grew them where no one else thought they could be grown and made them bountiful. So we should be thankful for them. Next, please. For the sake of our children. Many women worked in the canneries, whether it be, uh, you know, canning pineapples in Hawaii or sardines in Monterey. And if you, any of you have been in a cannery, 
you'll know, you know, it's hot, noisy, and in the case of sardines, certainly smelly. Uh, but they did that for the sake of their children in hopes that their children would have a better life, a better opportunity than they did. They did. Next, please. Bachan in a hat. Bachan means uh, grandma in Japanese. And my grandma always wore hats. Uh, she, uh, she worked outside a lot. She was a farmer. And uh, because she was so, you know, she was very uh, particular about her skin. She didn't want to get wrinkles, but she worked outside so much so that by the, by the time she was 50, she was wrinkled. Uh, but she was a, a very, very good to me. And she was the one that uh, helped me with my education, but brought me my first uh, world book encyclopedia, which I devoured from volume A to volume Z, uh, first page to back page. Next, please. After a hard day's work. Uh, these are plantation workers coming home at night after a day's work. And I picture men here, appropriately so, not that women didn't work in plantations too, but that in the 20s and 1910s, 20s, uh, in the early days, the bulk of the uh, Japanese American workers in Maui and Hawaii were men. There were very few women to go around. Uh, the ratio was something like one woman for every eight men. So both, most of the men were bachelors. They never married. Next, please. Mr. Y. Mr. Y uh, to me represents a Nisei or second generation, uh, you know, in the Salinas Valley. And here he's pictured with a tie and suit and carnation, but this was uh, for a family portrait at a wedding. And most likely he is a farmer or a shopkeeper. But what, what, what's more important about this picture and the many photographs that I've reviewed uh, in my research is the one thing that comes through of that generation is how dignified they are how proud they are. No matter what they di did, they were proud of their work, proud of what they made of themselves, proud of their family, and also hopeful, I sensed, that things will be better. Next, please. All those hopes came tumbling down with, with World War II. And I call this picture Gaman. It is a picture of, and Gaman, as Jerry says, means to endure the un unendurable with patience and dignity. Uh, this is a picture of an older gentleman awaiting transit to a prison camp in World War II relocation. The white tag you see is the ID tag that Jerry referred to in his art. And what that man's face says to me is, you know, this is bad. This is tough. This is gonna be hard for me. It's gonna be hard for my family, but we will get through this. I've been through worse. We will get through this and we will come back and we will get come back even stronger. Next, please. Only what they could carry. The Japanese Americans only had a few days to gather their belongings uh, before they were shipped off to the prison camps. And uh, they could only take what they could carry. So in some cases, that might be two suitcases, their homes, their cars, furniture, other possess possessions had to be either sold, sometimes 10 cents on the dollar, um, given away, or if they were lucky, they can loan them to someone, a friend who, who would be willing to give it, uh, loan it back to them or give it back to them once they came back. Just a little story, uh, my, my family, uh, part of my family is Catholic and they went to Marino Church in LA. And 
the fathers that Merino is part of the Franciscan order uh, serving the Asian population all over the world, but in LA, specifically the Asian American, Japanese Americans. And when the order came down for, for relocation, the fathers realized that their flock, they, they would not have no flock. So they said to the Japanese community, please, since you can't use our church, use our church as a warehouse. Bring all your belongings that you can't take or, or you don't want to sell or whatever, but you can store it at our church. Our family has been eternally grateful for the Catholic Church. All the children in my generation, in my family, went to Marino School, whether or not we were Catholic in appreciation of that gesture. Next, please. Looking back, this is a picture of a woman, as I imagine, looking back as she was being forced to leave her home for a prison camp. Looking back at her home, which was no longer hers, looking back really more at a life she no longer had, and looking forward to the unknown. Next, please. Topaz. Topaz was uh, the worst of the uh, prison camps in Utah. And this is where the uh, suspected Japanese Americans were imprisoned. Uh, suspected, if you were, you were suspected if you're a community leader. This meant if you are a uh, pastor, if you're a teacher, if you're a lawyer, a professional, a fencing instructor, or a fisherman with navigational tools or maps, you were suspect and you were hauled off to Topaz shortly after Pearl Harbor. Um, there you were subjected to long interrogations, beatings in some cases, and uh, some were held incommunicado with their families for, for the duration. Their families didn't know where they were or how they were doing. I should add that at, by the end of the war, not one Japanese American was accused of espionage or spying. Next, please. Invisible me. <clears throat> this is self-portrait of myself, obviously. Uh, and you can see that it's partially obscured because as I said in the beginning, I feel at times invisible in this society. And uh, I think it is starting to change, but I think historically, uh, Asian Americans, Japanese Americans have not been seen as uh, fully human in the US. They're certainly not seen as leaders or uh, heroes in politics or in work, and most certainly not in movies. And I remember growing up in the 50s and 60s. And uh, yes, I was addicted to TV, uh, like a lot of kids. And uh, my mother would always have to kick me out and say, get out and play. But I was a lot, of, I watched a lot of TV. And you know what, there was no one in TV that looked like me. In addition to a lot of uh, racist uh, World War II movies where the Japanese were made to look like uh, idiots and monkeys. Um, other than that, there was no, no hero that looked like me, right? John Wayne. And uh, it was many years later that I discovered Toshiro Mifune. Thanks, thank God for Toshiro Mifune, because then I wouldn't have any Asian hero at all. But, you know, there were a lot of incidents as uh, in growing up in America in the 60s and 70s. I mean, I recall in Chicago when I was going to school there that when I went to a bar with my four roommates, uh, the door cracked open a bit. This was in South Side uh, Chicago in uh, Cicero, Cicero area. And uh, he looked at us, said, well, um, let me see your IDs. So we showed him our IDs. He says, looks at him and says, okay. 
let me see your birth certificates. And we said, what? Birth certificates? Who, care? Who carries their birth certificate around? But we got the message. We were not wanted. And uh, we moved on. Uh, the uh, other, see, there's another situation where I was almost run down in Walnut Creek. Uh, and this was maybe 20 years ago. I mean, this was, and uh, by a guy, you know, run, running me down, took, calling me, get off the street, you dirty Jap, and uh, giving me the middle finger, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, it's not that it happened every day, but, uh, but it happened. So the picture, this picture is also saying to me that yes, we're invisible, but we are visible. Look at me, I'm here. See me as a full human being. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. It was for sharing everything. You're welcome. Here. Yeah, thank you so much. In the next segment, um, we'll have a conversation. And to start out, um, I'll direct a few questions to both you, Jerry, and Aki. And feel you can feel free to respond as you want and elaborate. So the first question is, your, for both uh, Joe and Jerry, your artwork conveys many meanings and messages what are what is the main thing you want your art to say what are you trying to portray or say through your paintings and and phot photography should i go first yeah go, go ahead, ahead jerry okay <laughs> well <clears throat> with the balancing cultures series it, it was like um speaking for my ancestors because Th that generation decided really not to say anything because of fear of retribution and what good would it do in a sense. But, um, but another thing that I think that the work, um, you know, the reason I did it was it, it required, it, it required a lot of vulnerability from me and it required me to, to kind of be open to, uh, saying the things that I had been taught my whole life not to say. And, um, and I think that vulnerability does, you know, lead to connection and that connection leads to healing. And I, and I, you know, I know that, that, um, it's just, it's just that people come to me and talk about the things that they get from the work that, you know, I never really expected because originally it was done for, uh, for my own healing in a sense. And it just happened to, in a sense, catch a wave politically, I think. Yeah. Well, I have, you know, I have, I think uh, healing is a large part of my art as well. But uh, I think what I was primarily trying to show was very simple initially was I just wanted to get some Asian faces in art you know and uh, you never see that in contemporary America you know you see black faces white faces of course but hardly ever an Asian face if you see an Asian face in a painting it probably is a scroll that's 300 years old from China or Japan or Korea so I simply wanted to give, say, look, give us dignity. We are, we, we, we are worthwhile. We are worth it to be the focus of a painting. But as I got into doing that and doing my research, I also wanted to tell more about the story of Japanese Americans in America, how they came here and uh, made a life here. You know, that makes, makes me think, um, 
that you know to you're you're saying that you wanted to see Asian faces mm -hmm. in the art world and I, it's a very interesting kind of thing because I guess partly for me you know the photographs we found were were in boxes in the garage that had probably been there for whatever 60 years or 70 I don't know long time and I liked them and I wanted to bring them back uh, out and on the wall somehow where I could live with them and update it in a sense. And I think the updating was saying something that I, I'm interpreting what they may have been feeling or saying, but um, you know, it was, a, it was sort of a resurrection of something that, that had been stored in a box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I should add also um, uh, that um, my inspiration was the, uh, or is uh, African American painters. African American painters, like the one I, the guy I really admire is Dean Mitchell. He does wonderfully beautiful portraits of his family, uh, friends, barber, you know, people every day that you would meet in his hometown. And he, he painted them with dignity and as full human beings. I, I, I was really inspired by that. And I said, you know, why don't we have that with Asians in our art? We don't. Uh, Joe and Jerry, both of you kind of mm -hmm. um, use photographs in, in your artwork. How, how did you come across um, those photographs? Uh, Jerry, you mentioned that you had some stored. Did, was there any kind of like searching for other photographs too, or kind of asking around from family members? Yeah, both, both there, can answer. Both can there answer. was some of that. There was some of, uh, you know, a spinoff of looking at my family's images and seeing other people in the images with my parents in the camps and then going to those people that we see in the photographs and asking them if I could see their albums to see whether or not there were pictures of my family in there. And, and occasionally there were. Yeah. Yeah, in my case, uh, I, I think uh, my process was very similar. I reached out to family for, you know, their family uh, photographs and such, but also, uh, you know, there's, there's some good books that, uh, like uh, uh, Ron Takaki's uh, book, uh, Strangers from a Different Shore, that has photographs in there, but also a very good history of all the Asians who came to America. And of course, the internet, we can't forget the internet. There, there's a trove of photographs there as well. And, and uh, I, of course, that's why, one of the reasons why my paintings tend to be abstract is that I don't want to infringe on the copyrights of the photographs, so my paintings really don't bear much resemblance to the actual image, but I get inspired by them. Yes, photographs can be very, very inspirational. Yeah. A picture is a window into a different time. Uh, moving on for the next question, I wanted to ask, the process of creating art can be very uh, intriguing and can explain many things. What have you learned in the process of researching and preparing your art and as well as sharing it right now with everyone? Well, I, I can go first on that one. Um, I learned three, I guess I would say three things. Um, is that I, in reading the stories of the early immigrants, especially, you know, from the 1850s on with the Chinese, um, it was hard. <laughs> it was difficult. They're coming into a foreign culture, which was the US. They're faced with uh, legal barriers, discrimination, and also cultural barriers. And yet they worked at the jobs they could get. They couldn't work just anywhere, but only certain jobs. They couldn't get educated in the school they want, wanted to go to. They couldn't live where they wanted, but they kept on generation after generation. And I think the other thing I learned is that 
uh, they did it with, with, as I said, with dignity. You know, you look at the photographs and these are, uh, you don't get a sense these are, you get a sense they're just proud. You know, it doesn't matter what they do or their situation. They're, they're proud of what they do and who they are. And lastly, I think I learned that we need to be indebted to them. You know, we have our lives today, which is so much better because of what they did many years ago. <clears throat> so Alex, I, th I think there's a couple of things. One, I, doing this project, you know, it felt like, it felt like it was a culmination of a long time of working up to this, um, because it was in the 80s, in 1982 or something, when I was first photographed uh, these, these uh, color kimono photographs uh, in my work. And, and I remember that being a bit of a, um, a moment, epiphany for me that, you know, it was, I, I was doing it partly because I was thinking of myself as being Japanese. And, and that, you know, I, I didn't know other photographers doing anything like that. And it was something that I thought, you know, I could kind of own. And it, and it's, it was my whole career I've been spending, I guess, getting comfortable with the idea that I was, that I am Japanese and that I have this heritage, but, but all the time I think I had that, that, um, in a sense, I guess un, I was unaware of the uh, um, the driving force behind my direction, which was a real, uh, like a silence about a truth that never really came out for me until I, I kind of saw those photographs. And so it, it was, you know, that, that was part of the a realization and something I learned. And also uh, the, new appreciation for what my parents and their uh, parents had to go through in regards to being exposed to racism and prejudice and hatred. And, you know, it was a huge thing. And I, and I, I don't, I, you know, I had to kind of research that to even make it real for myself. And when I, when I realized that I, I really felt um, I really had a new appreciation for what they had to go through. And um, just just today, you know, we evacuated from our home in the valley here. And, you know, we had two or three days to get our pieces together that we wanted to keep, you know, in a, in a long-term scenario uh, if, the, if the home were to burn down. And so, you know, I was trying, I, I kind of related that to the Japanese having, you know, two or three days to sell everything they owned and, and not even have, you know, and have all that hatred around them at the same time. And that, it just seemed, you know, it was hard enough doing what we did, let alone uh, what, what they had to do. It just, you know, gives, gives me a new appreciation for, for that difficulty. So couple of big things to learn. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, art gives a, is a very, the process of art and creating art and sharing it, I think really helps uh, with, you mentioned earlier, vulnerability is the, is the healing part of it, the self-exploration and the understanding your identity as well as like familial history and things like that. But I I really appreciated that quote that you shared about the stereotypes where um, I can't remember the the person who who said it, but how all stereotypes are harmful. And at one point or another, minorities have been excluded and persecuted in this nation's history. Right. Mm -hmm. Another question I wanted to ask is, why is your personal journey as conveyed through your art important to share now in this context, in this point in time? You want to go, Jerry? 
Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take, We're taking turns. <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. Um, it's a big one, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, really all I can say is that when, when I saw the images of my parents, you know, in the camp, it, it just changed from being a story to being something real because photography has this ability to <clears throat> make things feel like truthful. You know, it's like it really happened in time and and it kind of, you know, kind of etched it in stone for me. And, and I just, I couldn't, you know, there was no way I wasn't going to do that project. And at the same time, I think it took me a long time, even after finding the photographs, to to really do the first image because it, I had to like kind of work it through my my psyche for you know a year, a year and a half before I started. Um, but once I started, it was it flowed pretty well, and and my my most of my last two series of work were involving still life setups and collages. And, and so I was, you know, I had a vocabulary, visual vocabulary I could work with. And I kind of was, you know, inventing it for this pro project in, in a new way because I was adding, I was adding what I would, I call breadcrumbs. They're just text pieces in the, in the uh, photographs to help people, you know, understand some of the, the narrative. So I don't know, I, I guess, I guess, you know, if somebody asked me why I did it, it, it was just sort of a real deep com compulsion for, from uh, understanding something in a big way all at once. Thank you. Yeah, for me, um, it was a, um, a need to heal myself, similar to Jerry in a sense, but I think uh, coming from a different place, in that uh, when I turned, about 10 years ago, when I started painting full time, uh, outwardly, you know, I had a good career, good education, nice house, you know, I should be happy. I was very angry. Inside, I was very, very angry. I was angry at myself, who I was, uh, I was angry that I had an abusive father or stepfather, not my father, but my stepfather and my mother remarried. And we did not get along at all. <laughs> uh, but he was abusive toward me in an abusive country. I mean, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. America in the 50s and 60s was an abusive country toward Asian Americans and Japanese Americans. You know, it's, it's understandable. It's only... 10 to 15 years or 20 years after the war, a very vicious war from both sides. Um, but as I got into painting, I also worked through that anger. And, uh, but, and as I worked through the anger, and it's not that it's all left, but uh, you know, I think I can manage it better. Uh, I also learned so much about our history that I, my, my focus changed from just putting it out there to telling your story. I wanted to ask about the, the uh, group, the Japanese funded group that helps the survivors. Yes, ABOB Survivors or uh -huh. Organization, yes. You mentioned they provided healthcare support. Do they, did they offer any kind of um, like mental health or kind of counseling therapy support? Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, all I've seen in the, uh, in the uh, biannual checkups mm -hmm. is, uh, is uh, physicians, not psychologists, but I'm not sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you reach out for help, perhaps they have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think was one of the biggest yeah. uh, forms of healing is being able to speak about it and kind of process what happened. And in a way, both you, Joe and Jerry, your art mm -hmm. is is your is your way to to work through 
what had happened, right? It's our therapy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Art has a way of doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and what difference do you hope your art will make? I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, it's interesting that Joe worked through anger doing his work. And I, and, and I think I had to do that, too, because when I did the research and you start reading about, you know, how much how much hate, hatred was leveled at the Japanese Americans. Uh, you know, I started feeling upset and angry for my parents in a sense. And, you know, so obviously I think one of the things that, you know, you want to have come out of this or I want to have come out of this is, is, is just a, a huge new awareness because, uh, you know, it's, it's something that has pretty much been it's been fairly well documented, but I think, you know, more and more you need to do this kind of artwork because I think artwork transcends, you know, the left side of the brain. I mean, it, it just goes to your heart and it moves people in ways that history doesn't always move people. And I think it adds a certain kind of testimony and human drama to what you know as history. And it makes it like, my finding the photographs, it makes it more real. All of a sudden it becomes alive. And um, so, I, I mean, one of the main things is going to be, you know, trying to move people to understand what is a, what does a world without racism even look like? Because I, I think we're all about stopping it, but I, I don't think, I don't think where to, we know where to go next. And I think we're going to have to do that, you know, in a big way for a long time. But, you know, it's the next thing on the plate, I think, because we're, we're coming around to understanding that it isn't a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I think there are two, two reasons. Uh, first, I mean, let's, let's understand that we live in California, you know, where there are a lot of Asians here especially San Francisco area or, or LA mm -hmm. and in uh, the East Coast, New York and so on. But you know, between New York and LA, LA there, aren't, there ain't so many Asians. I, I've done a lot of travel. I studied in Chicago for two years. I, I traveled all, all over the US as part of my work. And you know, days would go by where I would not see any Asians, none, two, three days. I would be the only Asian you know, there. And uh, I mean, a funny story is that I am so used to being the only Asian in the crowd that it was a shock when I first went to Japan. I, I, I flew to Japan and we landed in Tokyo uh, and uh, all these men swarmed over the plane to, you know, do the maintenance. And they all looked like me. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was shocked. I was shocked because, you know, I'm always the only one. So, but the point I'm trying to make is that most people in the U.S. do not know an Asian person, an Asian American person on a personal level. What they are acquainted with are the stereotypes, right? Quiet, uh, stays in the background, computer scientist maybe, <laughs> you know, but that's a stereotype and I want them to see uh, the pictures, the, the art, and to get beyond that, to get into the history of my family and to get into our story of how we made our life here. And it is not so unlike their own stories, right? Unless you were uh, First Nations or Indigenous Amer you know, American, everyone of us immigrated here and they went through the same process Right? Germans, Italians, you name it. They went through the same kind of process. So I want them to get beyond the stereotypes and know that we are different, but we are just like them, right? As full human beings. The second audience I was trying to reach was Asian Americans, especially the younger ones. I don't think the younger ones who, you know, compared to before, 
Uh, I have two sons in their 30s. And, uh, you know, they have it pretty good, you know. <laughs> they don't have that many barriers. And, but I think they and others of their age need to know, need to know that they have this opportunity because of what came before them. You know, what their grandparents did, what their great-grandparents did, what their parents did. And they owe them a debt of gratitude. And they need to know that story, right? Of what they went through. Speak, yeah, speaking about that story, I, how did the code of silence among the first and generation family members after World War II and its aftermath help perpetuate the tendency of that feeling of remaining invisible, of not sharing what had happened or processing emotions and experiences? Hmm. How, how does your art break through that barrier of silence? Well, you, have, you know, one, one thing is that silence is part of Japanese culture. You know, the other side of gaman to, to, to uh, endure the unendurable and so forth, <clears throat> the other side is silence. To, to bear silently is another way to translate it, because silence is is, you know, buck up, you know, be quiet, <laughs> be strong, but be quiet, mm. don't complain, you know, and so that is part of the culture, and so it's very difficult, uh, I think, to break through that culture, because that, that, that is not what we do, you know, mm. so that's part of it. I, I think um, that, you know, at least the way I understand maybe what my parents might have felt was when they got back from the camps and they were trying to start their lives over again, they were surrounded again by, by uh, other, um, you know, American community members and and there was, you know, they felt, the Japanese felt um, that they were once, you know, singled out as the enemy and sent away to camp and then now they're back. And there was not a lot to be gained from talking about what happened, um, partly because they felt the shame that they were singled out. And also that, you know, it might be hard for, you know, people that, around them to listen to that or hear that. And that, that isn't necessarily a good thing. It's just the way it happened. And um, I, th I think, you know, the realization, I mean, like I, I say, maybe it was easier for me to do this kind of a project after they had passed because I'm saying all those things that, you know, they just never talked about to the world. They may have said some of that within their the little circles, but not to the world. And um, I think it needs to be said to the world. And Alex, I want to expand that question to include uh, the survivors of the A-bomb, mm -hmm. because there was a code of silence there as well. And after short, well, in Japan, after the A-bomb, the, um, the A-bomb survivors were seen as uh, someone you don't want to touch. They thought the radiation was, uh, was, they were contaminated and it was somehow transferred to them. And also they felt that uh, their genes were destroyed and you certainly wouldn't want to marry, you know, a survivor. And so there's a code of silence uh, if you were a survivor in Japan in those early years. And um, I myself was ashamed of being a survivor until just a few years ago. I, I told my... Um, my close friends, I told my sons, my two sons even, that yeah, you know, we lived in Hiroshima, but we were not in the blast. We just happened to be away that day and so nothing happened. When in fact, as I said, I, we were there. And it was only a few years back that I told my sons. And uh, because after all, um, uh, we have nothing to be ashamed of. We were the victims, right? We weren't the per perpetrators. But it, that took a lot of working through to get to that point. 
you feel like your art helped you make that breakthrough? Um, yes, I, I think so. Yes, that and the, the whole racist thing here in the US, yes, both. Thank you for sharing that. Um, question for Jerry. Sounds like your parents and grandparents went through great lengths to shield you from the impact of trauma they experienced. Was that, do you think in any way, was that healthy for them? Yeah, I, you know, they went to, maybe they went to great lengths, but it, it, I think it was just part of being uh, the Japanese in the Japanese culture. It wasn't maybe that hard for them to do. I don't know that it was that healthy for them to do. The you know at that time uh, you know in the in the fifties, I don't know that um, you know mental health care was that prevalent and and was probably stigmatized anyway. So, you know, they didn't have those opportunities to kind of work those things out. And, you know, they, what they couldn't carry, we ended up carrying, I think, in that next generation. And, and it manifests in all kinds of ways, I think, you know. In my, in my case, it's like trying to work it out through the arts. So, um, yeah. I, I do think it was not a, a real healthy thing, but you know, I have to say I don't feel as um, like having the experiences of racist, uh, you know, attacks towards myself. I, I've not had that experience so much, but I can, you know, just doing the research, I can imagine. I know they had to go through it, and. Uh, I think that's what they were shielding me from. And I think, you know, I'm certainly grateful for that. I mean, you know, it's it's a burden to carry that too. So <laughs> I don't know which is better, but I all I know is that, you know, diversity is the one thing we have in common. So, you know, let's let's get over it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, again, I would I would expand that question to include the A bomb. And mm -hmm. I, like I said, my mother didn't say a word about it for 61 years. Yeah. She didn't say anything until she was 85. <laughs> and that's when she had to, went to become legitimate in terms of the authorities with the ABOM Survivors Organization to prove mm -hmm. that she was actually there so that we could receive the benefits, right? And, but I was with her on that trip for 10 days uh, around Japan. We just didn't go to Hiroshima. We also made it a little tour. So I was with her day and night you know, and she just poured out her, 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 her story to me after that, the testimony before the A-bomb Survivors Organization. Every night, uh, she would tell me about the war, her experience, her life, because she had it all dammed up inside of her, but it just poured out. The dam broke loose and it just all poured out. Oh, a needed release. Yes. Yeah. Aki, you mentioned that Asian Americans um, are better off today, but what has the impact on families being denied opportunities to build and retain wealth over the decades? Oh, you mean, okay, well, um, you know, one way to look at incarceration or imprisonment in World War II was that what they were in. They were in prison camps, right? But also, from a financial point of view, mm -hmm. they lost two generations of wealth building in their families, right? And uh, you can see that I mean, in my own family. Uh, we, we, you know, most of our family is Hawaii, but we have big branches, a big branch in California. The ones in Hawaii, they were not sent off to prison camp. The ones in California were. And I think there's a difference in the lost wealth of those families, right? Two generations. So it had an impact. And for the attendees, why do you think that the, 
the Japanese communities in Hawaii were not sent to concentration camps? Well, if they were sent to, <laughs> if the Japanese Americans were sent to concentration camps in Hawaii, Hawaii would be empty uh, in 1941. Well, let's say half empty, about 40% of the uh, population in Hawaii were Japanese Americans and they were the farmers, they were the, in the ship, shipyard, the merchants, everything. So they couldn't, you know, the whole economy would grind to a halt. So they couldn't afford the, uh, to send them to camp. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that summed up most of our questions, but we do have some in the Q&A, which I kind of wanted to go through. Okay. One of them was, will you be making a recording of this and sending out a link? Um, Catherine, I think this is true, correct? Yes, that's correct. It's being recorded. And Thank we'll you. share it with attendees afterwards. Thank you, Catherine. Next question is, where do each of you live now? And do you show your work at museums? Here he does. <laughs> yeah, I do show it whenever I can. <laughs> um, you know, well, our home is in Carmel Valley, um, but we have uh, JT Mason has given us her guest house while we await the outcome of the Carmel fire. And at the since this will be this is a recording and will be sent out at the beginning of the this webinar um, in the intro section we mentioned a couple of museums where you can find Jerry's work. Well, my my art is not in museums yet. <laughs> Hopefully someday. <laughs> yes, I would like to see that. But right now, Joe, are you not, creating? those like for yourself? No, no, like I said, uh, my, my intent is to eventually um, get it out there. And as I said, my intent is to change, challenge people, mm -hmm. not just myself, but challenge people who see it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a saying in art, you throw your first 500 paintings away because you're only starting painting on your, 501st painting. I've probably done more than 500 paintings by now, but uh, I'm, I, I was in a uh, learning, I went through a learning process and it's only recently that I figured, I think I am hitting my stride, so to speak. So uh, hopefully you'll see much more of my art publicly soon. <laughs> yes, thank you. Don't forget the internet. Yeah. And uh, also Instagram. I post a lot on Instagram. We'll share your uh, both Joe and, and Jerry's uh, website. And if you guys want to uh, include in the chat a link to your Instagram, I think attendees would appreciate that. Sure. Uh, another question Where can we view your art with the narration? Are they shown in near? by art houses? Um, I'm not too sure. I think I think the best thing will be the video, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to come out of this program. Jerry, is any of your art shown with a narration? Um, you know, as of, I had a show at the conference center about a year and a half ago and I began, uh, you know, adding a kind of anecdotal captions to the work because it's, you know, it just it just kind of felt like it added to the the uh, feeling, the explanation, the story, the the humanity of it, and um, and I'm working on a um, on a you know monograph book project of that work, and. I think those captions will then be incorporated into that into that project. So, you know, as far as the video presentation, no. But uh, right now, I'm on, just working on this uh, publication project. Thank you. Yeah, your 
your artwork coupled in the earlier section, coupled with the explanations were very intriguing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also thought it was very interesting the the different things you incorporated within the picture, not just the text, but like mm -hmm. leaves and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, another question was, how do you feel about the Black Lives Matter movement? Is it one step forward to expose and heal racism? Well, I don't, I, you know, I don't know what, it's, it's so long overdue that it's not even, you know, it, it's just, I don't know what, what's taken, you know, it's, it's, it's something that has to happen and you know, we it's it's been it's been entrenched for so long that it's it's not easily reversed. And if you you know understand anything about, I mean, it's it's so you know entrenched in in our culture in America that if you live in America, you know we we are all biased. I mean, we are. We can't help it. I mean, it's. It, those messages are coming at us from every possible direction. So, you know, I, I, I'm definitely, you know, support the Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, it's just, but it's just a huge structural thing that just needs to be totally dismantled, start over. But, you know, it's, things change slowly. <laughs> in this country or maybe in the world, I don't know. But, uh, you know, like I said earlier that mother nature has shown us how diversity is the, is the ticket to surviving on this planet. And, you know, we, we just don't seem to be taking her advice. Yes. I, I totally agree with Jerry. I, I, I you know, I, I think uh, it's a very important Important movement, and I, you know, I, I, we talk about racism against Japanese, but you know, the Japanese American, Japanese and Japanese Americans are racist in their own way. Right? Yeah, they're all racist. I mean, uh, one of my most embarrassing moments was I asked a <laughs> friend of mine who was an African American to go to uh, to a uh, ofudo. Ofudo means hot springs. And typically, you you know you go bare into a hot tub, like a hot tub. This was in San Francisco, and um, so we went. In. I made I made a reservation. Went in, and they looked at me and they looked at my friend. They said, "I'm sorry, there's no room. We're all booked." I said, "Well, I made a reservation." And she says, "No, I'm I'm sorry, you're not here." I said, and I started to get angry because I knew I made one, and my friend pulled me back. Says, "Uh." Aki, it's okay. It's okay. Let's, let's get out of here. Because obviously, uh, you know, he's had that happen to him before. And it's no, you know, that's the way it is. But we all, you know, we all are inflicted, afflicted with that terrible thing called racism. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Uh, oh, we have another question. What are the most important personal shifts you have made as a result of taking on these projects? Shifts? Personal shifts. I think, um, you know, I think I'm just more keenly aware of, of the whole structural racism now that you know i had done that research uh and you know continue to kind of investigate and read other um, pieces on on what it what racism is about and, and i'm just you know i just see things a little differently so you know it just i felt the shift in perception of everything around me. I mean, it, it's just, you know, the way people behave, the idea of, you know, what is, what is privilege and how does that look uh, in action and it's happening all the time in subtle ways. And, 
you know, those are the subtle ways that we, we get uh, conditioned into behaving the way we do. So, you know, it, it, it kind of has to start with that kind of uh, all encompassing awareness of those kinds of, of those, those little devices working in our lives all the time. I mean, it would be anything from movies to education to music to, you know, everything that we experience is is kind of loaded with that different messages that want to guide you. Yeah, in my, in my case, certainly um, my perception changed as far as my family and where it came from. You know, just to have a fuller sense of what they went through, but not just my family. Families like them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in, a, in, in a new appreciation. I think personally, um, it's not solely through my art. I had a lot of help from uh, an organization I belong to called Breakthrough. Um, and uh, it helped me work through these difficulties with anger and a feeling of worthiness that pretty much uh, correlated with my art. You know, so they went together and probably reinforced each other as I went through the process. So I'm less angrier, angrier man today than I was 10 years ago. <laughs> That's good. It's yes. good for your health. <laughs> good for my friends too. And my no. wife. <laughs> I think um, I just keep throughout this conversation, I keep remembering, Jerry, what you mentioned about we we have identified that racism is a problem and we need to get need to understand the implicit biases that we hold but it, now start moving into asking that question well what does what does a world without racism actually look like and i think that starts with identifying the structural inequalities the, the inherent foundation to that enables races racism among groups and not just among different groups but among the same Thank you. Thank you for all, for sharing all that. Well, I, just, do, I also wanted, oh, yeah, go ahead, Joe, yeah. go ahead. I mean, just, just think of the economic uh, inequalities and how that affects people. I mean, in this current uh, pandemic quarantine with the virtual schools, the huge disparity uh, um, between school districts and how the children can learn, you know? In poor school districts, they don't have access to high-speed internet. They don't have computers. Uh, they don't have all these aids. Uh, and so they're at a disadvantage. So, you know, anything you look, look at, there's that disparity of opportunity and resources to deal with, uh, to deal with society. Thank you. I wanted to let the attendees know um, in the chat, there is Jerry's Instagram at Jerry Takigawa, and also the links to both Jerry and Joe's uh, websites to learn more about their artists. So https forward slash takigawaphoto.com and www.joekiou uye.com and so, you can find them in there yeah so the instagram is at j-o-e my name joe mm -hmm. Aki Owe. So, i can include that yeah. j-o-e Owe. yeah joe Aki Owe. all one oh okay. one word okay mm -hmm. um Thank you. Does anybody have uh, last call for questions? Anyone want to ask? You can either ask them through the Q&A option at the bottom, or you can even type them into the chat if you would like. And also, there has been an outpour of support thanking from attendees, thanking you, Joe and Jerry, for, for sharing. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's great.
<laughs> okay, to close, um, I don't see any other questions being asked. But to close the program, I want to thank so much for our speakers, Joe and Jerry. Thank you so much for sharing your art and your your deep moving personal stories, your experiences, your family histories, your art, your pictures, everything for sharing that with us and letting us, giving us a glimpse of what the Asian American experience, particular to those um, Japanese Americans have experienced in the United States and are continuing to experience now moving forward and re kind of that reconciliation process and getting rid of the shame you guys explained. Thank you so much for everything. Um, I, again, you guys can learn, for attendees, you can learn more about Joe and Jerry on their website. And as well as, um, I don't know, Catherine, if you would like to share the, there's two articles for both Joe and Jerry, one on the Pinecone and one on the Weekly, kind of explaining more about you guys are explaining more about yourselves if anybody was interested thank you all for joining us today for this virtual event and before signing off I want to acknowledge and thank our co-sponsors the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Monterey County Branch the Japanese American Citizens League of Monterey Peninsula the Monterey Peace and Justice Center the National Coalition Building Institute of Monterey County the Peace Coalition of Monterey County Veterans for Peace, chapter number 46, Whites for Racial Equity, and Monterey Peninsula Friends Meeting, Quakers. Please note the actions you can take to support the remaining survivors of the 1945 bombing in the earnest and their earnest desire that no one else should suffer as they have. No to all nuclear weapons. No more Hiroshima, no more Nagasaki. And yes for peace, equality, inclusion, the environment, and social justice. And if Catherine, you would like to share that last um, picture with the different actions people can take. Oh, and for attendees, the Pinecone article link is in the chat. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Yes. And there's, there's a slide. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And then lastly, I have shared in the chat Joe's Instagram. <laughs>